Section 12 of The Diaries, Volume 1, by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. On the 7th of November, we went again near the capital, toward the Tarpeian Rock, where it has a goodly prospect of the Tiber. Thence, descending by the Tullianum, where they told us St. Peter was imprisoned, they showed us a chapel, San Pietro da Vincioli, in which a rocky side of it bears the impression of his face. In the nave of the church gushes a fountain which they say was caused by the Apostle's prayers, when, having converted some of his fellow captives, he wanted water to make them Christians. The painting of the Ascension is by Raphael. We then walked about Mount Palatinus and the Aventine, and thence to the Circus Maximus, capable of holding 40,000 spectators, now a heap of ruins, converted into gardens. Then by the Forum Boarium, where they have a tradition that Hercules slew Carcus, some ruins of his temple remaining. The temple of Janus Quadrifons, having four arches importing the four seasons, and on each side niches for the months, is still a substantial and pretty entire antiquity. Near to this is the Arcus Argentariorum. Bending now toward the Tiber, we went into the theatre of Marcellus, which would hold 80,000 persons, built by Augustus and dedicated to his nephew. The architecture, from what remains, appears to be inferior to none. It is now wholly converted into the house of the Savelli, one of the old Roman families. The people were now generally busy in erecting temporary triumphs and arches with statues and flattering inscriptions against His Holiness's grand procession to St. John de Laterani, among which the Jews also began one in testimony of gratitude for their protection under the papal state. The Palazzo Barberini, designed by the present Pope's architect Cavaliero Bernini, seems from the size to be as princely an object as any modern building in Europe. It has a double portico, at the end of which we ascended by two pair of oval stairs, all of stone, and void in the well. One of these led us into a stately hall the volto whereof was newly painted a fresco by the rare hand of Pietro Berentini il Cortone. To this is annexed a gallery completely furnished with whatever art can call rare and singular, and a library full of worthy collections, medals, marbles and manuscripts, but above all an Egyptian Osiris, remarkable for its unknown material and antiquity. In one of the rooms near this hangs the Sposalicio of San Sebastian, the original of Annibal Caracci, of which I procured a copy, little inferior to the prototype, a table, in my judgment, superior to anything I had seen in Rome. In the court is a vast broken gullia, or obelisk, having diverse hieroglyphics cut on it. 8th November 1644 we visited the Jesuits' church, the front whereof is esteemed a noble piece of architecture, the design of Giacomo della Porta and the famous Vignola. In this church lies the body of their renowned Ignatius Loyola, an arm of Zaverius, their other apostle, and at the right end of their high altar, their champion, Cardinal Bellarmine. Here Father Kircher, Professor of Mathematics and the Oriental Tongues, showed us many singular courtesies, leading us into their refectory, dispensatory, laboratory gardens, and finally, through a hall hung round with pictures of such of their order as had been executed for their pragmatical and busy adventures, into his own study, where, with Dutch patience, he showed us his perpetual motions, catoptrix, magnetical experiments, models, and a thousand other crotchets and devices, most of them since published by himself or his industrious scholar Schotti. 
Returning home, we had time to view the Palazzo de' Medici's, which was an house of the Duke of Florence, near our lodging, upon the brow of Mons Pintius, having a fine prospect toward the Campo Marzo. It is a magnificent, strong building, with a substruction very remarkable, and a portico supported with columns toward the gardens, with two huge lions of marble at the end of the balustrade. The whole outside of the facciata is encrusted with antique and rare basso relievos and statues. Descending into the garden is a noble fountain governed by a mercury of brass. At a little distance, on the left, is a lodge full of fine statues, among which the Sabines, antique and singularly rare. In the arcade near this stand twenty-four statues of great price, and hard by is a mount planted with cypresses, representing a fortress with a goodly fountain in the middle. Here is also a row balustrade with white marble covered over with the natural shrubs, ivy, and other perennial greens, diverse statues and heads being placed as in niches. At a little distance are those famed statues of Niobe and her family, in all fifteen, as large as the life, of which we have ample mention in Pliny, esteemed among the best pieces of work in the world for the passions they express, and all other perfections of that stupendous art. There is likewise in this garden a fair obelisk full of hieroglyphics. In going out, the fountain before the front casts water near fifty feet in height, when it is received in a most ample marble basin. Here they usually rode the great horse every morning, which gave me much diversion from the terrace of my own chamber, where I could see all their motions. This evening I was invited to hear rare music at the Chiesa Nova. The black marble pillars within led us to that most precious oratory of Philippus Nereus, their founder, they being of the oratory of secular priests under no vow. There are in it diverse good pictures, as the Assumption of Girolamo Mutiano, the Crucifix, the Visitation of Elizabeth, the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin, Crisco Sepolto of Guido Reno, Caravaggio, Apino, and others. This fair church consists of fourteen altars and as many chapels. It is buried, besides their saint, Caesar Baronius, the great analyst. Through this we went into the sacristia, where the tapers being lighted, one of the order preached. After him stepped up a child of eight or nine years old, who pronounced an oration with so much grace that I never was better pleased than to hear Italian so well and so intelligently spoken. This course, it seems, they frequently use to bring their scholars to a habit of speaking distinctly and forming their action and assurance, which none so much want as ours in England. This being finished, began their motettos, which in a lofty cupola, richly painted, were sung by eunuchs and other rare voices, accompanied by theobos, harpsichords and viols, so that we were even ravished with the entertainment of the evening. This room is painted by Cortona, and has in it two figures in the niches, and the church stands in one of the most stately streets of Rome. 10th November 1644. We went to see Prince Ludovisio's villa, where was formerly the very diarium of the poet Sallust. The house is very magnificent, and the extent of the ground exceedingly large, considering that it is in a city. In every quarter of the garden are antique statues and walks planted with cypress. To this garden belongs a house of retirement built in the figure of a cross after a particular ordinance, especially the staircase. The whiteness and smoothness of the excellent pargeting was a thing I much observed, being almost as even and polished as if it had been of marble. Above is a fair prospect of the city. In one of the chambers hang two famous pieces of Bassano, the one a Vulcan, the other a Nativity. There is a German clock full of rare and extraordinary motions, and in a little room below are many precious marbles, columns, 
urns, vases, and noble statues of porphyry, oriental alabaster and other rare materials. About this fabric is an ample area, environed with sixteen vast jars of red earth, wherein the Romans used to preserve their oil, or wine rather, which they buried, and such as are properly called testi. In the palace I must never forget the famous statue of the gladiator spoken of by Pliny, so much followed by all the rare artists, as the many copies testify, dispersed almost all Europe, both in stone and metal. There is also a Hercules, a head of Porphyry, and one of Marcus Aurelius. In the villa house is a man's body, flesh and all, petrified, and even converted to marble, as it was found in the Alps, and sent by the Emperor to one of the Popes. It lay in a chest or coffin, lined with black velvet, and one of the arms being broken, you may see the perfect bone from the flesh which remains entire. The rape of Prosperhine, in marble, is of the purest white, the work of Bernini. In the cabinet near it are innumerable small brass figures and other curiosities. But what some look upon as exceeding all the rest is a very rich bedstead, which sort of gross furniture the Italians much glory in, as formerly did our grandfathers in England in their inlaid wooden ones, inlaid with all sorts of precious stones and antique heads, onyxes, agates and cornelians, esteemed to be worth eighty or ninety thousand crowns. Here are also divers cabinets and tables of the Florence work, besides pictures in the gallery, especially the Apollo, a conceited chair to sleep in with the legs stretched out, with hooks and pieces of wood to draw out longer or shorter. From this villa we went to see Signor Angeloni's study, who very courteously showed us such a collection of rare medals as is hardly to be paralleled divers good pictures, and many outlandish and Indian curiosities and things of nature. From him we walked to Monte Cavallo, heretofore called Mons Quirinalis, where we saw those two rare horses, the work of the rivals Phidias and Praxiteles, as they were sent to Nero by Tiridates king out of Armenia. They were placed on pedestals of white marble by Sextus V, by whom I suppose their injuries were repaired, and are governed by four naked slaves, like those at the foot of the capital. Here runs a most noble fountain, regarding four of the most stately streets for building and beauty to be seen in any city of Europe. Opposite to these statues is the Pope's Summer Palace, built by Gregory the Thirteenth, and in my opinion it is for largeness and the architecture one of the most conspicuous in Rome, having a stately portico which leads round the court under columns, in the centre of which there runs a beautiful fountain. The chapel is encrusted with such precious materials that nothing can be more rich or glorious, nor are the other ornaments and movables about it at all inferior. The hall is painted by Lanfranchi and others. The garden, which is called the Belvedere di Monte Cavallo, in emulation of that of the Vatican, is most excellent for air and prospect. Its exquisite fountains, close walks, grots, piscinas or stews for fish, planted about with venerable cypresses and refreshed with mortar music, aviaries and other rarities. 12th November 1644. We saw Diocletian's baths, whose ruins testify the vastness of the original foundation and magnificence. By what Michelangelo took from the ornaments about it, tis said he restored the then almost lost art of architecture. This monstrous pile was built by the labour of the primitive Christians, then under one of the ten great persecutions. The church of San Bernardo is made out of one only of these ruinous cupolas, and it is in the form of an urn with a cover. Opposite to this is the Fontana delle Terme, otherwise called Fons Felix. 
In it is a basso relievo of white marble, representing Moses striking the rock, which is adorned with camels, men, women and children drinking, as large as life. A work for the design and vastness, truly magnificent. The water is conveyed no less than twenty-two miles in an aqueduct by Sextus V, ex agro columna, by way of Prineste, as the inscription testifies. It gushes into three ample lavers raised about with stone, before which are placed two lions of a strange black stone, very rare and antique. Near this are the storehouses for the city's corn, and over against it the church of San Susanna, where were the gardens of Salust. The facciata of this church is noble, the soffitto within gilded and full of pictures. Especially famous is that of Susanna by Baldassa di Bologna. The tribunal of the high altar is of exquisite work, from whose marble steps you descend underground to the repository of diverse saints. The picture over this altar is the work of Giacomo Siciliano. The foundation is for Bernardine nuns. Santa Maria della Vittoria presents us with the most ravishing front. In this church was sung the Te Deum by Gregory the Fifteenth, after the signal victory of the Emperor at Prague. The standards then taken still hang up, and the impress waving this motto over the Pope's arms extipentur. I observe that the high altar was much frequented for an image of the Virgin. It has some rare statues, as Paul ravished into the third heaven by Fiamingo, and some good pictures. From this we bent toward Diocletian's baths, never satisfied with contemplating that immense pile, in building which 150,000 Christians were destined to labour 14 years and were then all murdered. Here is a monastery of Carthusians called Santa Maria degli Angeli, the architecture of Michelangelo, and the cloister encompassing walls in an ample garden. Montalto's villa is entered by a stately gate of stone built on the Viminalis, and is no other than a spacious park full of fountains, especially that which salutes us at the front, stews for fish, the cypress walks are so beset with statues, inscriptions, relievos and other ancient marbles that nothing can be more stately and solemn. The citron trees are uncommonly large. In the palace joining to it are innumerable collections of value. Returning, we stepped into St Agnes Church where there is a tribunal of antique mosaic and on the altar a most rich ciborio of brass with a statue of St Agnes in Oriental Alabaster. The church of Santa Constanza has a noble cupola. Here they showed us a stone ship borne on a column heretofore sacred to Bacchus, as the relievo intimates by the drunken emblems and instruments wrought upon it. The altar is of rich porphyry, as I remember. Looking back, we had the entire view of the Via Pia down to the two horses before the Monte Cavallo, before mentioned, one of the most glorious sights for state and magnificence that any city can show a traveller. We returned by Porta Pia and the Via Salaria near Campo Scalarato, in whose gloomy caves the wanton vestals were heretofore immured alive. Thence to Via Felix, a straight and noble street, but very precipitous, till we came to the four fountains of Lepidus, built at the abutments of four stately ways, making an exact cross of right angles, and, at the fountains, are as many cumbent figures of marble, under very large niches of stone, the water pouring into huge basins. The church of San Carlo is a singular fabric for neatness, of an oval design, built of a new white stone. The columns are worth notice. Under it is another church of a structure nothing less admirable. Next we came to Santa Maria Maggiore, built upon the Esquiline mountain, which gives it a most conspicuous face to the street at a great distance. 
The design is mixed partly antique, partly modern. Here they affirm that the Blessed Virgin appearing showed where it should be built 300 years since. The first pavement is rare and antique, so is the portico built by Pedro Pedro Eugenius II. The Saborio is the work of Paris Romano and the tribunal of Mosaic. We were showed in the church a concha of porphyry, wherein they say Patricius the founder lies. This is one of the most famous of the seven Roman churches and is, in my opinion at least, after St. Peter's, the most magnificent. Above all for incomparable glory and materials are the two chapels of Sextus V and Paulus V. That of Sextus was designed by Domenico Fontana, in which are two rare great statues and some good pieces of painting. And here they pretended to show some of the holy innocents' bodies slain by Herod, as also that renowned tabernacle of metal, gilt, sustained by four angels, holding as many tapers placed on the altar. In this chapel is the statue of Sextus in copper, with basso relievos of most of his famous acts in Parian marble. But that of Pope Paulus, which we next entered opposite to this, is beyond all imagination glorious and above description. It is so encircled with agates and other most precious materials as to dazzle and confound the beholders. The basso relievos are, for the most part, of pure snowy marble, intermixed with figures of molten brass, double gilt, on lapis lazuli. The altar is a most stupendous piece, but most incomparable is the cupola painted by Giuseppe Reni, and the present Baglioni, full of exquisite sculptures. There is a most sumptuous sacristia, and the piece over the altar was by the hand of St. Luke if you will believe it. Paulus V hath here likewise built two other altars. Under the one lie the bones of the Apostle St. Matthias. In another oratory there is the statue of this Pope and the hand of the Congo ambassador, who was converted at Rome and died here. In a third chapel, designed by Michelangelo, lie the bodies of Platina and the Cardinal of Toledo, Honorius III, Nisophorus IV, and the ashes of St. Jerome, and many others. In that of Sextus V, before mentioned, was showed us part of the crib in which Christ was swaddled at Bethlehem. There is also the statue of Pius V, and going out at the further end is the resurrection of Lazarus by a very rare hand. In the portico is this late inscription, Cardinal Antonio Bavarino Archpresbytero, Area Memoriam Quam Christiorum Pietas Exculspit, Laborante Subtiranis Exclesia, Ut Esset Loci Sanctitate Venerabilio, Francis Gualdus Arm, Equa San Stefani, E Suis Oedipus, Huc Trans et Ornavit, 1632. Just before this portico stands a very sublime and stately Corinthian column of white marble, translated hither for an ornament from the old Temple of Peace built by Vespasian, having on the plinth of the capital the image of Our Lady, gilt on metal. At the pedestal runs a fountain. Going down the hill we saw the obelisk taken from the mausoleum of Augustus, and erected in this place by Domenico Fontana with this epigraph, Sextus V, Pont Max Obeliscum Ex Egypto Ad Vectum, Augustine Morsolio Dicatum, Eversum De Inde Et In Plures Confractum Partes, In Virad Es Rocum Jacentum, In Pristinam Faciem Restitutum, Salutifere Cruci Felicius, Hic erigi usit anno MDL XXX V I I I Pont three, and so we came weary to our lodgings. At the foot of this hill is the church of San Prudencia, in which is a well filled with the blood and bones of several martyrs, but grated over with iron and visited by many devotees. 
Near this stands the church of her sister, San Prexides, much frequented for the same reason. In a little obscure place, cancelled in with iron work, is the pillar or stamp at which they relate our blessed Saviour was scourged, being full of bloody spots, at which the devout sex are always rubbing their chaplets and convey their kisses by a stick having a tassel on it. Here, besides a noble statue of St. Peter, is the tomb of the famous Cardinal Cajetan, an excellent piece. And here they hold that St. Peter said his first mass at Rome with the same altar and the stone he kneeled on, he having been first lodged in this house, as they compute about the forty-fourth year of the Incarnation. They also show many relics, or rather rags, of his mantle. St. Lawrence in Panisperna did next invite us, where that martyr was cruelly broiled on the gridiron, there yet remaining. St. Bridget is buried in this church under a stately monument. In the front of the pile is the suffering of St. Lawrence painted a fresco on the wall. The fabric is nothing but Gothic. On the left is the Terma Novatii, and on the right Agrippina's Levacrum. 14th November 1644 we passed again through the stately capital and Campo Vaccino toward the amphitheatre of Vespasian, but first stayed to look at Titus's triumphal arch, erected by the people of Rome in honour of his victory at Jerusalem. On the left hand whereof he is represented drawn in a chariot with four horses abreast. On the right hand, or side of the arch within, is sculptured in figures, or basso relievo as big as the life, and in one entire marble, the Ark of the Covenant, on which stands the seven-branched candlestick described in Leviticus, as also the two tables of the law, all borne on men's shoulders by the bars, as they are described in some of St. Hiram's Bibles. Before this go many crowned and laureated figures, and twelve Roman fasces with other sacred vessels. This much confirmed the idea I before had, and therefore, for the light it gave to the holy history, I caused my painter Carlo to copy it exactly. The rest of the work of the arch is of the noblest, best understood compositor, and the inscription is this in capital letters, SPQR, D. Tito D. Vespasiani F. Vespasiano Augusto. Santa Maria Nova is on the place where they told us Simon Margus fell out of the air at St. Peter's Prayer and burst himself to pieces on a flint. Near this is a marble monument erected by the people of Rome in memory of the Pope's return from Avignon. Being now past the ruins of Meta Sudante, which stood before the Colosseum, so called because there was once stood here the statue of Commodus provided to refresh the gladiators, we enter the mighty ruins of Vespasian Amphitheatre, begun by Vespasian and finished by that excellent Prince Titus. It is 830 Roman palms in length, i.e. 130 paces, 90 in breadth at the area, with caves for the wild beasts, which used to be baited by men instead of dogs. The whole oval periphery, 2,888 and 4 seventh palms, and capable of containing 87,000 spectators with ease and all accommodation. The three rows of circles are yet entire. The first was for the senators, the middle for the nobility, and third for the people. At the dedication of this place were 5,000 wild beasts, slain in three months during which the feast lasted, to the expense of ten millions of gold. It was built of Tibertine stone, a vast height, with the five orders of architecture, by 30,000 captive Jews. It is without of a perfect circle, and was once adorned thick with statues, and remained entire, till of late that some of the stones were carried away to repair the city walls, and build the Farnesian palace. That which still appears most admirable is the contrivance of the porticoes, vaults and stairs, with the excessive altitude which well disturbs this ditch of the poet, omnis Caesareo, cadat labor amphitheatro, 
unum procunctis farma loquitur opus. Near it is a small chapel called Santa Maria della Pieta nel Colisio, which is erected on the steps or stages, very lofty at one of its sides or ranges within, and where there lives only a melancholy hermit. I ascended to the very top of it with wonderful admiration. The arch of Constantine the Great is close by the Meta Sudante, before mentioned, at the beginning of the Via Rapia, on one side Monticello, as is perfectly entire, erected by the people in memory of his victory over Maxentius at the Pons Milvius, now Ponte Molle. In the front is this inscription, Imp Keys Fle, Constantino Maximo, P.F. Augusto, S.P.Q.R., Quad Instinctu, Divinitatis Mentis Magnitudine Cum Exercitus Suo Tam de Tirano Quam de Omnia Eus Factione Uno Tempore Justis Republicam Ultus Est Armis Arcum Triumphis Insignium Dicavit. Hence we went to San Gregorio in Monticello where are many privileged altars, and there they showed us an arm of that saint and other relics. Before this church stands a very noble portico. 15th November 1644 was very wet, and I stirred not out, and the 16th I went to visit Father John Provincial of the Benedictines. End of section 12